As I mentioned before, today's text is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. And it's interesting that dare say that the middle section of this, uh, these verses, I'd be willing to bet that many of us have it completely memorized. Um, there are a few scriptures that are like that. And as an acknowledgement that God's word is special. If you're able to, will you please rise? Matthew 6, verses 1 through 15. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You may be seated. And we'll I look forward to your sermon. The Lord's blessings be upon you. Good morning to each of you. Oh. Thank you, Greg. I, I can't advance you to hear my sermon if I don't have the clicker. And this is very true this morning. It's good to be back with you. As many of you know, I was on vacation during the month of July, and then there was a snuck-in extra Sunday at the end of the month. Did you notice that? And all of a sudden, it added almost two weeks onto the time that I would be back with you. And so it's kind of, I said to Doug this morning, it's, it seems surreal that I am back here this morning and look forward to it a great deal. But I had a great vacation. I don't think that you'd want to just see pictures of beaches and beach chairs and little uh, turtles scurrying off into the ocean after they'd hatched early in the morning. I didn't think you'd want to see any of that. So I decided I would compose myself, not bore you with pictures, and get right to those things that are most important. But it is very good to be back with you. We had a wonderful vacation time in Florida. I, by way of preference, many of you already realize I tend to preach a little longer than most. 
Is that not true? I'm not bragging at all. I don't want to say that. But uh, I, I reflect on a, a situation that happened in another congregation one time. One of the men, shortly after I was there, had preached a little bit. He said, uh, you know, I really believe if you can't say it in 15 to 20 minutes, you ought not to say it. I don't need any amens at that point, please. And, and this dear brother also taught a men's Bible study that took an hour. And I thought about that, and, I, and one day, just out of, just kidding, because I knew the man fairly well by this point, I said, you know, I find it interesting that you think I should be able to do something in 15 to 20 minutes, and in your Bible study, you take a whole hour. And I smiled at him and shook his hand and walked away, and it was at the end of my sermon that day that he came up to me and he said this, Walt, take as much time as you need. <laughs> so, you could, without any further comment, you could see our text and it's titled this morning, The Prayer of Growing Disciples. And I want you to just think about that a minute. This is a prayer for growing disciples. And there are reasons why I say that, but I don't want to, I'm not going to get involved in what that's all about at this point. I'm just going to let you think about that for a minute. I want you to recognize that our context this morning, and I wanted, I wanted to say this too. Sunday school class this morning was very interesting because I kind of felt like it even said, I think we ought to have the benediction on the sermon right now because you've covered all the points that I was going to cover in my message. But... Uh, but I want us to recognize that the context that we're coming into, in fact, I want to, if you've got your Bibles open and you're following along, I want to read actually the last verse of chapter 5 of Matthew. Because Jesus says this, what, as he's talking about his, the Beatitudes and some very important points of the law, he says this in verse 48, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we could take that in our lives to be mature, but that concept of we are to be like our heavenly Father is very important. But the context here is, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. And then Jesus says, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. To me, translations are very are very unique. My, my New American Standard will be a little different than some of yours that you use. But I found it interesting that uh, if we aren't careful about how we do what we do, we have no reward with our Father. Not from our Father, with our Father. And I find that very interesting because of what Jesus is going to share as he comes, as we come through this text. But that idea of with, not uh, that he's going to give us, but we're going to share it with him, has a very interesting connotation. And I'm just going to say it has the connotation of relationship. That is very important. So that's the context that we're coming into. Now, I want you to also know that what you see on the screen is, is about all I have here. But because I have had, I have been using this prayer, the, what we have often called the Lord's Prayer, but I see it as a mature disciple's prayer. I have been using this in, for the last two years and finding out that it has things in it that I never thought about as I did a cursory reading or often re uh, repeated it with a group of people. And so I want to invite you this morning into an experience of this prayer. Not just, it's a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Luke tells us that the disciples came and said, Lord, we've watched you pray. Teach us how to pray. And in Luke's shorter version of this prayer... Uh, he, he is teaching them how to pray. And I think that's very interesting, especially when we look at some of the features 
of the prayer itself. But as we, as we move into this instruction of the Lord's uh, on prayer, we recognize that in verses 5 to 6, hypocrisy versus sincerity is, is key there. Do not be like the hypocrites or those who want to be seen by men. So there is this idea of hypocrisy versus sincerity. My question to you is, why do you pray? You ever thought of that? Prayer to me is one of those elusive things that can be tacked down in a number of different ways. But I want us to recognize this morning that there's a very important prayer. Our question about prayer is, why do you pray? What are your motives for praying? Are you praying because you earnestly, sincerely want God's will in that area that you are praying about? Or is there, in fact, a relationship that you have because you care for the person, you want that person, if it's a prayer for another person, you want out of that relationship for them because you love them, you want them to get what it is you're praying for them about. Sometimes our motives are other than what God may want for an individual. I could spend and give you illustrations, but for time's sake, I'm going to leave it there. But it's interesting that Jesus then talks about meaningless repetition. And it seems as though the indication is, is that the more I say it, the sooner I am heard. Versus being to the point and brief. Think about that a minute. When, when you pray, do you tell Jesus Everything about the prayer concern. I, I've often noticed when we give prayer concerns, we meaning the general church, whether in, in this congregation or others, we have to tack it down. It's, it's his best friend's mother's dog's right paw. And we've got to give you the whole scenario about what it is. And... And I've recognized sometimes that I, I go, God, why do I have to give you that stuff? Aren't you sovereign in the universe? Don't you know that? And, and so can I just not say, Lord, you know Jim's concerns, or you know Betty's concerns, or you know the, the situation that one or several are in, and I just ask that you would minister to them according to your will. And all of a sudden, my prayer time gets shortened. <laughs> and sometimes in corporate prayer, that happens. And sometimes there's education and instruction that goes on in prayer. But in this case, Jesus is saying, don't, don't think that God is going to hear you because you tell them everything about this one small thing. But be to the point and brief. And it's really in, in contrast to number two about meaningless repetition. And I wonder how often in our prayer lives, when we come down, and many of us may have prayer lists, that we, we kind of say the same thing about the same thing over and over again from our prayer lists. I wonder how that ties into being meaningless repetition. Find that interesting. But then he talks about in uh, uh, he talks about in verse eight uh, about our needs. Verse eight says this: says therefore, um, I'm sorry. Verse seven: when you are praying. I'm sorry. Let me, let me verse eight. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Think about that. Your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. That means even before you open your mouth, God already is working on it. I find that fascinating. And, and, but I want, I want to ask you this question. Are you sure you know your needs? I was praying one time a few months ago Maybe it was longer ago than that. And the Lord stopped me. Have you ever had the Lord stop you in the middle of praying to Him? It's a bit disconcerting. 
And, but I was praying about some needs. And, it, and he stopped me and I recognized, wait a second. I'm talking to the God of the universe. And I'm telling the God of the universe what I need? And I recognized that I, trade, I changed my prayer. I said, Lord, I think I need this. <laughs> but you know what I need. You know when I need it. And you know how I may need it. There's a poem that I, I memorized some years ago. And I don't even know how I memorized it. But it just is there. I don't know if you've had anything like that. In, in your own memory experience. But there's a gal by the name of Eliza M. Hickok, and she wrote a, a poem, and I've entitled it about prayer. But, it, but she says this in the poem. She says, I know not by what methods rare, but this I know, God answers prayer. I know not if the blessings sought will come in just the guise I thought, so I'll leave my prayer to Him alone whose will is wiser than my own. Find that very helpful because I want God to answer the things in my life that he, believe, he knows I need rather than just telling him what I need. I may say, Lord, I, I think I need this, but I'm not sure. There, there's also an interesting contrast in secret in verse 6 and he knows in verse 8. There is something about our God that we oft not think about. And that is that God can see our secret places where we interact with Him. And He also knows before we ask. Our God is a God who knows everything all the time. And so we can be brief with our God. Because he knows it all, and, and the real thing that he wants for us, as we will see in a moment, is we want, he wants us to come to him. And there's a very important reason why. So let's, let's move on from there and look at the, the prayer itself. Now, I, I got this in my notes, but I'm looking at it with you because it's also important that we share the same things. I want you to notice that when he gives this prayer, he says, when you pray, he gives two brief sentences, first of all. And, and I use the word brief because they're very brief. If I were to read this section alone, it may take me 10 seconds. But yet Jesus says to me and to you and to the disciples, when you pray, pray, pray this way. And so we recognize that the first two brief sentences are about our Father in heaven and His desires to be fulfilled. Notice I've underlined His desires because that's very key. It is we're praying for His desires to be fulfilled. And I wanna, I'd like to go back just a minute to that Jeremiah passage. And, I, and I, I came upon this and I said, man, this is really good. And listen to what Jeremiah says. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. That a man knows me. Now, I could, we could go into an understanding of the Hebrew text of the idea of knows. I would just recognize that it's the same word that Adam used to describe knowing his wife. An intimate sense of knowing the person. And this is the same word that's used here. That that person knows me intimately. 
I think one of the biggest challenges in, in the church today is that individuals who claim to know Jesus still don't know Jesus. They know of Jesus. He's at an arm's length. Oh yes, I, I accepted Jesus. But they've never really gotten to know the Savior. And the invitation here is, you will notice that, that Jesus starts out and says in the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. And so there's that, I don't know if you ever stopped and said, well, what does it mean, our? Our Father. We share the same important relationship individually with the Father that each of us are to have. But it's our Father. Together we come to Him. And then, it, and then he, wants us, he wants His name to be reverend, reverend, reverenced, honored, set apart in holiness from all others. That's what He desires. He wants us when we come to Him to recognize that there is no one on the face of the earth like Him. Because He's supreme. He's, he's very different from any of the other supposed gods that's going on in our world. The, whatever the religious circle that's going on. And so He wants His name to be revered, reverenced. Now, look at this. We are praying that His kingdom will come. How many of you want his kingdom to come? I won't ask you to raise your hands. But if you think about that a minute. I am asking in that prayer that his kingdom come. How do I understand the kingdom? Do I understand the kingdom of something that's way off there? Or do I understand the kingdom like Jesus described it? where he says the kingdom of God is not only out there, parenthetically I'll say, but the kingdom of God is within you. If that's true, and Jesus said it, so I believe it's true, then the kingdom coming means that I am living into the kingdom with my very life in relationship to our Father who is in heaven. I actually control by my behaviors and my choices and all of those things, I control the kingdom of God coming into through my life into relationships. And if I am not wholly reverencing my Father in my life, then I am missing opportunities to live into the kingdom. And if, if we are not careful, we can together miss living the kingdom into our lives and into our congregation. Then he says this, His will be done. Wow. That is probably one of the most difficult faith statements to be, to be shared. Not my will, not that person's will, but God, my Heavenly Father, I want your will to be done. God has... God has several sides of His will. If the, and the world understands a different kind of God's will than you and I do. There is the will of His judgment. And we recognize in the Old Testament, there was a lot of judgment going on that was God's will for disobedience. God will, in fact, judge those who are disobedient to His will. And so there is that sense of, well, I'm not sure I want that kind of God's will. But also there is the will that you and I hopefully experience, and that is, God, I don't know what you're doing through my circumstances. But I want you to know I want what you want rather than I want you to want what I want. And so when we pray about His will being done... We recognize in heaven it's always done. On earth it's always done, but it may be done in judgment for judging those who are wicked. 
but it also has to do with what God is doing through me according to His will. I have a very, pardon the pun, short illustration. Did you get that? Short illustration. The one thing I wanted to be in high school, I wanted to be the center on a basketball team. Now, how many of you think that I prayed that God would make me the center on a regular, got it, regular basketball team? I knew that prayer from the start wasn't going to get it with my Heavenly Father because like Jeremiah and like all of us, God has a purpose for us from the very point of conception. And He wants His will to be worked out in all of the biological settings that are developing in the womb and will play their way out through life. Now, we could go into a deep dive into that, but I just want you to recognize that I, as a maturing believer, am still constantly wrestling with but wanting that statement to be true in my life. And it's not an easy statement to make could share with you about the struggle that I had when we lost our 22-month-old baby girl, Sarah. I wanted to say, God, I'm not sure you know what you're doing. And I was, going, I was saying that out of a father's love for a child. But I recognized that he was sovereign in the universe. And that if he didn't control what was going on in my daughter Sarah's life and her passing then how could I begin to trust a God that couldn't, doesn't have his finger, his, his control, so to speak, on everything? And it was out of this prayer that I said, I had to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm trusting you in this one. I'm giving her to you because you know what you're doing in the midst of what I'd like you to, to do. And so his will to be done takes a, an extreme amount of faith and we are constantly growing into the kingdom coming in our lives and his will being done through our lives by what he has given us to handle, to carry, to enjoy, etc. And then of course on earth, I want it done on earth as it is in heaven because I just want God to reign. And I'm, I, I struggle right now with a lot of things going on in our country. We've got, in parts of the nation, we've got wildfires because it's been so dry. And you, you know, you've heard the reports that there is an aqua, or there's the, the water that's being shared by a, several different uh, um, states is at critical levels. In fact, the, the lake I saw this, this morning or earlier that it had dropped 40 feet and it was at a critical level so much that they may have to cut off some of the farming uh, use of the water because it's so critically low. But I ask myself, what is God trying to say to us? Because we cannot just look at the human aspects of scientific whatever. We must ask the question, what is God's will in this? And if people are not obeying and reverencing Him for who He is, He will begin to short-circuit some things that people think are ongoing so that hopefully in that process they will turn to Him. And my concept of who God is is that God wants the very best for me. And it's not an ego trip for Him when I worship Him. It's that He can move into my life in ways and bless me in ways that I never dreamed of. And so, on earth, as it is in heaven. And then we move, we move from those two sentences to verses 13, 11 to 13, and we have two, three brief sentences about our needs. There's the need for daily food or bread, and that could be enlarged to a number of different categories, one sentence, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. 
It's not, you know, I want a, I want a V8 Ferrari that'll go down the road and do it in, in zero to 60 in less than five seconds. It's give us this day our daily bread. I wish I understood what that all meant in light of a number of very important principles, but I would just pause to say, ponder to, uh, pause to, to say, what is our need in relationship to our daily bread? And if we have more than we need, I, I, I reflected on that not long ago, and I said, you know, if my wife stopped going to the store right now, I'll venture to say I might not like the food, but I would venture to say that before we cleaned out our cupboards and our freezer and we were destitute, I think we could probably survive for a month or better without going to the store. What is God saying about the abundance that he's given us? But we pray for daily food. Here's a, I, I, was, I, had a, I was struggling with a question. It's a moral dilemma question, and it's this. You know that you can't go another day without bread. And you happen to know where you can steal a loaf of bread. So, do you steal the bread and stay alive another day? Or do you not steal the bread and die that day? If you put it in the context of, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and God says no, what is he saying? Thie thievery is wrong. And I would simply, in a very simplistic example, and it's very simplistic, I would, sim I would simply say, you know, Lord, if a person isn't going to give me the bread that I need from your hand, then maybe you are calling me home through my own hunger. Do you, do, you get that, do you get that understanding here? That we are relying on the God of the universe to provide something very essential, and if he says no, maybe he has a bigger picture in mind. But that's not an easy thought process for us. We live in America, the land of abundance. We have never really understood what it is to pray for daily food like some others in our world. And then, and then here's one that, I, how about we just stop right now before I go into this next one? Is that all right with you? Can we just stop and not, never come back to it, never touch on it again? Many congregations do not want Jesus to have said this in his prayer. Can I read it to you? as it is in my translation. Forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our sins, as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's a, that's a prayer that, that most Christians don't want to pray and maturing believers sometimes have great difficulty praying. Because if this is true, personal forgiveness based in a condition, and the condition is verses 14 and 15, where Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Bless you. Think about that a minute. Do you, does that speak at all into things that happen in churches when somebody won't forgive somebody and bitterness and anger and resentment and, and all of that stuff wells up? I have been in congregations where there have been multiple exits and entrances in the church and there will be a brother or, and, or two brothers or two sisters, they were very close at one time and there was a disagreement. And that disagreement was not resolved amicably according to the will of God. It was not resolved. It left people hostile and bitter and anger towards each other. 
And, and the one brother or sister would come in and survey the congregation and say, well, I can't sit over there this morning. I'll have to sit over here because that's where the sister I have the beef with. And is there any, is, is there any thought of why so often God can't do more in our churches? And I would simply say, it has to do with praying, wanting to receive God's forgiveness, but recognizing we can't have that until we do the job that our Heavenly Father, who is perfect in heaven, has already done, and that is to forgive us. That, my friends, is a truth for discipling believers, maturing believers. It's not an easy thought. And then, of course, the next statement, and we're moving to the conclusion, says this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I've, I've got a phrase, I, I rephrase that to get at the heart of what was, I believe Jesus was saying. It's for deliverance from situations which may cause me to sin. Lead me not into temptation. Do not put me into situations, Lord, where I will be prone to sin. Now, if you think about that for a minute, how many situations are you ever in that it is impossible for you to sin in? So all of a sudden, Jesus is poking a little fun. God, I don't want to be in those situations because I, I don't want to sin. But yet the rest of the phrase is, is a counteracting that says this, and when in such situations... Keep me from the evil one or being under his influence by sinning. So you see, I, I don't know of many situations that I, I am in that it is impossible for me to sin. I don't know about you. Most of us can sin sitting right here in this, these pews. But he prays that we'll be delivered from the sin that we could do because of the rest of the prayer, certainly. And then, I, I recognize there's an ending here, the King James ending, and I have it in my Bible with a footnote that says, for thine is the power and the glory forever, amen. If you look very closely at your modern translation Bibles, you will have a footnote, and many times, if, it, if that statement is in your translation, it will be noted in a margin because this was not, in, in all the manuscripts, and if, I don't know if you understand how, they, how translations are done, but they take the oldest manuscripts that they have, and they, then they begin to compare them and try to f f understand which was the most, most oldest to the, the more current. And in the oldest manuscripts, this King James ending, for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, is not in any of the oldest manuscripts. doesn't mean it isn't sound, because after all, thine is the power, thine is the glory, and so forth. And so I just wanted to note that, but we must conclude. And here's where I'd like us to conclude. Yes, I would. Maybe we're not supposed to conclude. you ever get that idea? There we go. So why is this the prayer for growing disciples? There are two reasons. The first reason is this. It draws us into a growing relationship with our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. You see, that's what God wants. The first part of prayer is that we are entering into a relationship and growing into that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so... If we're growing in our relationship, we will look at those first two sentences in the part of the prayer and recognize that we want His will done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. But then it also does this. It continues to build our dependence on God the Father as our sustainer. And to me, that's one of the most important parts of this prayer that God wants me to depend on Him. Maybe, maybe I don't need to ask Him, Lord, should I buy this or not? 
But, but when I get to this point and recognize that God wants to continue to build our dependence on Him as our sustainer, I must ask, Lord, is this what you have given me this excess for? And let Him speak into the excesses and the, the needs of what I think I have in my life. So those are some of the things that I have recognized about this prayer. I appreciate you listening, but I would invite you to on a regular basis for the next few weeks that you would begin to take the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or forgive, oh, I, I left it out, didn't I? Forgive us as we forgive each other, etc. But pray that prayer and begin to analyze it, ask questions about it. What does it mean, our Father? Spend some time with the Lord going over that. And I have found that I have done, as I have done that, I'll be praying. And, and prayer isn't just talking. Prayer is listening. And it's in those listening moments that the Holy Spirit will put things in your mind. And I have had this prayer come back when I've been praying. Oh, there's one other thing I want to say, and I, I, I should have put it in earlier. When you pray, it goes into why you pray. Have you ever thought beyond the situation of what you're praying about? Maybe you're praying for a friend's surgery. And I found out one day, I was, as I was moving through this prayer, thinking about it, I recognized that I was pray, as I was praying for someone with a need that I knew, there were thousands, if not millions, of people just like the person I know. And so now when I pray, I say, Lord, I know this person and they have a need. But Lord, I am also aware by sheer numbers that there are multiple people that have this need as well. Would you touch their lives and work your will out in their lives as you do in this situation that I'm praying about because I've been asked to or for a friend? Because you see, our prayers permeate the world because God wants us to recognize that He wants control as our sustainer. So, would you bow your heads with me as we bring this portion of our worship service to a conclusion. Lord, we love you. We've mouthed that and we mean it. We want your will, Lord, to be done on earth in our lives. And we so much desire to understand this prayer and its impact on our lives in a way that will cause us to grow deeper in our relationship with you. It will cause us to grow deeper in our relationship with each other because of the new freedoms that we will find. And we certainly want you to be our sustainer and nothing else. Even though you bring many things into our lives to sustain us, we would recognize that those things are from you. So, Lord, we thank you for what you continue to do in our lives and for our congregation. And we continue to pray that you would be our God and we would reflect in our lives who you are in whatever the situation, for it's in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen.